Hey guys, this is Lala Legacy, and welcome back to another episode of Seabed. So, let's just jump right back in. Hey, Takako spoke up as I arrived. So, decided on a place yet? Of course! You okay with Western food? Seeing my nod, Takako started up the car. It moved so smoothly I couldn't even tell she was changing gears. What was that phone call in the afternoon all about? Uh, Mr. Sasaki from the, uh, from the Tinners has apparently conquered another mountain. Takako halted the car just before the white stop line. After looking to the left and to the right, she turned onto the main street, leaving our alley behind. Isn't mountain climbing getting a bit too much for the guy, given his age? I'd say so, which is why I asked the university's mountain climbing club to accompany him. You did? Yes, I had an errand to run back on campus, so I figured, why not? As the traffic light turned green, the line of cars began to edge forward again. Hmm, how did you even come up with an idea like that? Remember when we talked about the Alps the other day? How can you go, or how can you, or how you can go, sorry, there and hire a local instructor who will help you carry your bags and build tents for like 500 yen? Ah, oh, that does ring a bell. Takako, with her hand still glued to the wheel, leaned slightly forward to confirm the neighboring traffic lane. There weren't even, or there weren't many cars on the road, leaving more than enough space for us. Takako checked the side mirror and changed traffic lanes after signaling. Last time I met him, Mr. Sasaki was going on about how, how much of a shame it was that Japan had no service like that. Hmm. And when I talked to him over the phone, he told me how happy he was to have finally gotten the chance to climb that thing, while also making new friends in the process. That's nice to hear. The slight swaying of the car felt pleasantly sleep-inducing. Um, Sachi? What? I mentioned this before, but I think we should increase the number of departments in our office. Even though it's only the four of us? That's precisely why. Right now, no one really thinks much about the differences in our duties. If we get stumped by something, someone else just comes in to help out. But now that we get more er, but now that we get more offers, everyone's forced to stay overtime. I think we should start defining clear roles for everyone. Then we'll be able to tell exactly what's holding us back and what could be improved. Hmm. So what kind of roles do you have in mind? I think we should continue what we or what we're already doing for the most part. You as the manager, Fumi as the accountant. Meanwhile, me and Inakai should concentrate more on the business side of things. I should be in the first department of design, doing planning and development, while Inakai should be in the second department, mainly taking care of orders and dealing with clients. What about the clients you've been managing until now? If possible, I'd like him to take over. As the head of the second department, Inakai should have complete authority over everything client-related. He said he wanted more freedom, so I get the feeling he'd be up for it. Hmm. Uh, sorry, guys. Whew. <laughs> and if we're going to get uh, bigger in the future, we'll be able to increase the amount of people in any of the departments. At one point, we can hire someone to take over your management duties. And since I don't need to deal with customers anymore, I get more free time as well. If that works out, we'll have more free time for or we'll have more time for trips and our hobbies and all the fun stuff. I'm starting to see what your main objective is. Well, duh! All I care about is having fun with you. I recall telling you that when I quit my last job. I suppose you did. I closed my eyes, remembering how we ended up quitting our previous jobs. Going independent after having saved some money was mainly Takako's idea. She might have seemed she might seem a bit of a scatterbrain from time to time, but her ability to plan for the future far exceeded mine. I don't mind if you sleep. My head nodded as the car rolled over a bump in the road. 
I straightened my back. I'll stay awake. I glanced out the window and saw the neon lights of the radio tower gleaming in the distance. There were more cars on the road than before. Were you sleeping? Just a little bit. Takako checked the side mirror, and then turned the wheel to the left. I could feel the slight onset of, uh, cent centru- Ah, sorry guys. I am tired. I woke up not too long ago. My roommate has a body spray that I'm allergic to, and she sprayed it this morning, and I have a massive headache, and yeah. Uh, I could feel the slight onset- our onset of centrifugal force pressing me against the seat. As our car entered the new road, it began soundlessly speeding up. We've been working overtime so much lately. This week will be the last, I promise. I guess it'll take some time before we get anything this big again. Yeah. Giving an absent-minded reply, I gazed at the orange lights through the windshield. I leaned against my seat, narrowing my eyes. You are tired, aren't you? Takako made a faint smile, observing, uh, observing me from the corner of her eyes. How far are we? We should be there in about ten minutes, I think. Will you take a nap after all? I might not wake up if I give in now. Want to listen to some music? Takako reached uh, out toward the audio panel. I'm not in the good mood right now. Okay. Takako returned her hands to the wheel. I won't fall asleep if we talk. Oh, hi, Alex. He's playing Hitman. <laughs> Want to hear a scary story? Maybe some other time. Hmm. Takako heaved a contemplative groan. How about a story about my adventures overseas? I was there too, remember? What was our first trip again? Taiwan. Oh, that's right! Our plane landed in Taipei, and we took a bus straight to our hotel. Did you forget? Outside, it felt like you were in a sauna, but the interior of the bus was freezing cold, right? My sweat dried up in an instant. Where did we go first? Hmm, I think we went to a convenience store. We bought an instant camera. I remember you kept going on and on about how they had too many or so many convenience stores around. And that weird juice we bought? Turns out it was strawberry flavored toothpaste. We also went to the kingdom of the little people. There was this jet coaster spinning in an ins or in an at an insane speed uh, speed, right? Sorry. <sighs> yeah, I remember that. I picked a side seat. So, or, I picked a side seat so I could, or so I thought I'd get crushed when you fell on me. I told you I didn't want to get on. But it was fun! What else did we do? Feeling my eyelids grow heavier, I finally closed them. Hello! Did you get embarrassed? I felt too drowsy to even open my mouth. I couldn't even make out what she was trying to say anymore. You fell asleep? Takako still seemed to be talking. It sure was fun! I hope we can go again sometime! I opened my eyes as my seat jerked violently. The lights inside the train fell, or fell dark for a moment, but soon returned to normal. Realizing that I felt cold, I fixed the collar of my thick cardigan. The night train was almost completely devoid of passengers. There was only one family sitting diagonally across from me that boarded the train at the same time, or at the same station I did. Trails of raindrops trickled down the window behind them in the opposite direction the train was moving. I want a chopsticks toy! The boy with a hoodie turned to the man, who was most likely his father. 
chopsticks. I've never even heard of such a toy like that. All my classmates have it. I asked Santa to get me one for Christmas. I see. Well, what do these chopsticks look like exactly? The boy made an odd shape with his hands. The rain grew fiercer by the minute, brushing against the windows in the wave-like pattern. I saw a town in the distance, its streets distorted as I looked at them through the rain-soaked windows. A heavy storm cloud, blocking out even the moonlight, loomed over the cityscape, covering it in darkness. I realized I could see myself reflected in the window. Brushing the hair out of my face, I glanced down at the book resting on my knees. After the boy and his father had gotten off the train at the next station, I was left alone in the silence. I raised my face to look up the fogged up window behind the now empty seats. The lights of the town grew dimmer, and in the dark and distorted reflection of the train interior, I thought I saw the hazy figure of Takako sitting next to me. I looked to my side, but the seat was empty. As I returned my gaze to the window, all I saw was my own lonesome, or my own lone self sitting in the empty train car. Stepping into the living room, I could see the cloudy morning sky through the windows. Its canvas contemplated, or er, complemented, sorry, by a mag multitude of buildings towering in the distance like they were an elaborate bar graph. I flipped the switch on the wall, leaving only the lamp on the nightstand on. <sighs> a groan escaped my lip as I left the cold in the room. Or as I felt the cold in the room, sorry. I lifted off a paper paperback off the shelf below the phone. I bought the thing shortly before my business trip at a bookstore near the station. After making myself comfortable on the sofa next to the window, I swiped off the dust from the book I had just picked up and began reading from the page that had my, er, my bookmark. Yet, after only a few pages or so, I had to return the, or to the first page again. I went at it again, skimming through the parts I understood on my first go, turning pages with one hand while adjusting my glasses with the other. The somewhat loose and metallic part of my working slash reading slash computer glasses turned with a low creak. The washing machine I turned on before coming to the room let out a loud beep just as I was about halfway done with the book. I closed the book and went to pick up my laundry. The orange hue of the morning sky <clears throat> entered my vision through the window as I rose from the sofa. By the time I finished hanging the last of my clothes, the white shirt of my work outfit the sun that was only slightly peeking from the horizon when I had started uh, had risen high into the sky. A stray gust of wind drifted in through the window, making my laundry flutter like the many legs of some octopus-like being. As I gave Takako's shirt on the hanger, or hanger a few pats, my hand hit something hard around the vicinity of the breast pocket. I slid my finger into it and pulled out a wet business card. I turned it over but the name was too washed out to read. In the end, I returned to my room and flipped the thing into the trash can. Inhaling a lungful of air, I glanced at my paperback, still resting on the sofa, and then the fridge, before my gaze finally settled on the calendar hanging on the wall. An illustration of an autumn landscape decorated its current page, right below the name of the month. More specifically, it displayed a post-harvest field split apart by a long road in the middle. The road itself was flanked by trees on both sides, their fallen leaves covering the ground with spots of orange and yellow. The hands of the wall clock next to the calendar completely overlapped. I rubbed my right shoulder with my left hand and continued to the kitchen. 
For breakfast, I whipped up some scrambled eggs with salad. Once I had finished eating it, I began cleaning my apartment. First, I separated the boxes in the corridor into the things I should keep, things I should throw away, and things I should send it to Kako's family. I brushed the dust off one of the boxes I decided to send. I grabbed a magic marker from the living room and popped off its cap. Looking carefully at a postcard I took from the bundle near the phone, I wrote the address of her house on the front of the box and mine on the back. Before tapping the er, before taping the box shut, I slipped in a letter I wrote for her family. It was an apology for being so late to send it. As I finished packing, I returned to the living room and phoned the delivery service, booking them for the earliest possible time. After placing the phone back to its place, I turned around and noticed the boxes all separated into categories of what should be left here and what should be sent away. Not a single box had been marked to be thrown away. Things I couldn't figure out uses for I instantly discarded, while the rest went back into their boxes. By the end of it, I didn't have enough items to fill even a single box. I picked up the scissors and packing tape from the floor. Is this everything? Yes, thank you very much. As the middle-aged man carried the last of my boxes with his broad arms into the elevator, a younger and taller man handed me the receipt. The younger man gave me a or gave me a brief bow and hurried away to the elevator that the older man was keeping open for him. Once I saw them leave, I locked my door and returned to the living room. Placing my wallet in the bamboo basket, I heaved a brief sigh. I glanced at my feet to see the rays of the sun almost reaching them. After directing a brief glance at the clock on the wall, I stepped onto the balcony and touched the denim panties. Uh, what? Denim? <laughs> okay. Um, on the hanger to check if they had dried. As I gazed outside, I spotted the balcony of the mansion to my left. The futon that was there when I was hanging my own laundry had since disappeared. I collected my clothes and closed the balcony door behind me. I sat down next to the mountain of clothes and started folding them. I, or it felt somewhat cold in the apartment after closing the windows, but the sunlight filtering in from outside warmed me up a little. After folding the jackets, I separated the clothespin from the underwear and uh, folded them as well. I grabbed the matching socks by the cuff and folded one into the other to create a ball. I heard the floor creak as I picked up one black sock and continued to look for the next. As I returned uh, the dark or the dark blue sock I picked up by mistake to my mountain of accumulated laundry, the living room door opened. Takako appeared in her pajamas and continued to the kitchen, stifling a yawn with one hand. I followed her with my gaze until she disappeared behind the corner. I continued staring at the wall that Takako vanished behind for a couple of seconds when her head suddenly popped into view again. Do we have anything to eat? No. I'm hungry. Takako gave her belly a light pat. It's way past lunchtime. You'll have to manage until dinner. Do we have any snacks? No. With that, Takako disappeared back into the kitchen. I could hear the sounds of the opening drawers. No way! There's really nothing here! Did you already eat all the cookies in the jar? When did we even have such a thing? Whatever, I guess I'll just eat sugar or something. Hey! I'll start preparing dinner after I'm done with the laundry, okay? What are you going to make? I absentmindedly checked the calendar and the clock on the wall. I don't know. What do you want? Sukiyaki! We don't have enough soy sauce. Then I'll go buy some! Takako emerged from the kitchen holding a cup of barley tea. Is, is there anything else you need? Soy sauce and meat for sukiyaki. I can manage the rest. I'm not seeing any shirataki either! Takako opened the fridge and looked inside. That too. Is that all? I guess I could use some detergent. Gotcha. 
Okay, well, this is all the time that I have for this episode, guys. So if you liked it, please give it a big thumbs up down below. And if you haven't already, subscribe. By subscribing, you're becoming part of a legacy. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!